We're going to talk about the concept of hybriding. We've got a meaty ITL for you. You're going to meet a super fan. You know you're at Pensado's place, but let the choir say, Yay! I over practiced my yay. It was it was like <laughs> it was a little yay on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Woo. The FDA may show up. You a Barry Barnes lawyer? Anyways, welcome. Well, I ever do a, a good show. You always do, man. No. That's what makes it you. No, uh, golly, I embarrassed my whole family lineage that time. Man, uh, we had fun this week, didn't we? We did. We, we did. always kind of go over the what happened during the week, and we never have anything to say. This week, we got a lot to say. Well, it was uh, all Nam. It was a lot of Nam. Yeah. Uh, I enjoyed it. Drew and uh, Zan and Andrew and I went down and hung out. We 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 had a good time. We, we were rolling around like rock stars. Yeah. 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 I um, I went down one day and was amazed at the response, you know, I was almost like, oh You're my a God. celebrity, man. No, I'm, no what, what's, what's so funny is, is uh, Dave had, you did, you stopped by the McDSP booth, right? Yeah, Colin and Ralph are my guys. And did that thing. Where yeah. else did you go? You stopped by uh, Vintage King with Drew, too, right? Yeah, yeah. I, I, um, of course, we did Avid with Anthony and, right. and Tony. That was a lot of fun. We straightened out a lot of mythology about the uh, Pro Tools 10, mm -hmm. and then, um, uh, our old buddy Mark at BAE showed me a new compressor that's it's a oh, beast cool. herb. It's really good. Oh, cool, cool, cool. And uh, uh, the isotope people, isotope five, that was that was real cool. Erica over at UAD, they've got a couple of new things. Uh, our buddies at Bricasti, they've got um, a converter that 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 came out, got reviewed, made the cover of a very prestigious magazine. This cool. is supposed to be great. Uh, what else did I well, see? Well, I know on Friday I saw pictures of you looking like a star and had various things and saw comments. And then Saturday we did the, uh, as you said, the Avid thing together. And the Avid system, nice stuff. Apparently it was mm -hmm. the largest draw that they had for the for the thing. And Tony Caridi and those guys and Anthony and uh, Lee yeah. Whitmore and a bunch of folks. There was some cool <laughs> was stuff. Great. I mean, Waves has this thing I can't wait to try out. It's called NLS, right, Drew? And um, <laughs> my buddy Cliff Mogg, he's got uh, he's got some neat stuff. Uh, I, I think I can talk about it. Um, Peter Montesi at A Designs, who's my buddy over there. Dave Perlman's got a new microphone. Uh, Dave Hill's got stuff. Lots of stuff. Lots of stuff. Man. We also had another experience. Focus right. Uh, absolutely. We also had another experience that uh, kind of blew us away, and um, blew us away enough to the point that we wanted to talk about it a little bit. At the end of our Avid appearance, which Dave did partially with. Um, and they talked about Pro Tools 10, and in the last half I shared the stage with Dave, and we talked about <clears throat> the show and the impact of all you guys and where we were going, all that kind of stuff. At the end of it, generally, people come up and they talk to us, and we sign autographs and so on and so forth. And we met a guy who blew us away in terms of his commitment to the space, his commitment to the show, and we were just kind of jaw-dropped. So we thought we'd introduce him to you guys, right? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So I, we're, we're kind of calling him a super fan. It's so one of those moments that makes all this Yeah, in fact, Thursday with the Abbott guys, well. we were talking afterwards, we almost got emotional. But anyways, instead of us talking about once you meet him, meet somebody, meet a super fan of ours named Roman English. There's Roman. Hey, we, hey guys, how are you doing? <laughs> He's obviously yeah. not Drew. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the story about Roman, which we'll tell him, is we, afterwards we were, Roman is from Russia. And flew, Saint I think. St. Petersburg. St. Petersburg, yeah, right, Roman? Yeah, right. And how long did you fly to get to the show and tell us about your feelings about us and all that stuff? I took uh, 32 hours to me to fly from Russia to here. I was flying over the Europe, over the United Kingdom, Iceland, Greenland, Canada. I flew wow. to Seattle and then to Los Angeles. It's just unbelievable. And then I met guys. And it's just, I, I just came here to say thanks because all me and all of my friends really appreciate the work guys doing here because it's in Russia is the only way to learn something really, really great. Man, from that's the cool. Greatest guys. Thank you guys for doing this. Oh, thank, thank you. By the way, just a little footnote. Um, he, he met us at NAM, like, like 
Herb said the show, but you, you can't find the show. We work out of a, a huge compound in, in Pacoima that you just, it's impenetrable, so there's no point in dropping by there. <laughs> but, but we ran into him at the NAM show, and uh, that, was, that, that was the highlight of the NAM show. Well, we get a lot of, and, and we, look, we got great guests and great ITLs, so we won't linger on this too long, but the reality of it is, is we're blessed by your attention. Um, we got a lot of passion for your attention. We understand the effort to fly, 32 hours as he just described to meet us and we were also taken not just us but also the people around us in his enthusiasm and stuff and I think it's a metaphor for the power of the audience the passion of the space and and, and Roman let me ask you this before we before going from that is engineering your passion is that what you want to do or yes I'm all about music and engineering I started six years ago I went to a recording school in St. Petersburg and then I took took off because it's not so so you know so great to, to learn things by from the books and I started to work in, in the studio and I was learning things from the internet from uh, lots of stuff and that's my passion I, I can spend 12 hours in the studio then I can't sleep whole night doing what I did wrong what I did right oh I want to be there <laughs> I want to be there tomorrow and that's that that that's my way yeah I, I really enjoy it so, yeah, that's, so that's great so man. do us a favor just before we leave you say something to your countrymen in Russia because because just because we think it's so cool to hear the language yeah mother Russia Привет, парни. Это невероятная возможность, когда Херп написал мне что я могу прийти, увидеть э, всех, посетить шоу, и это отли... Давайте все, все, все со следующей серии выразим им огромный респект количеством просмотров, количеством комментариев и всем, всем комментариев и всего подобного. Парни. He said hello. He said hello. <laughs> We absolutely thank you. Yeah, thank you so much, Roman. Um, it's amazing how international you guys have made Pensado's place. Uh, we hey, can I bring up one more we thing? We admire your commitment. Yes. Um, and you, 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 you guys, you guys remember when Herb, you did a little soliloquy at at uh, at Nam that. And at some point in time, I'd love for you to kind of recreate that for the okay. show. That was right. that, that was touching. Maybe we'll do an ITL on it or something. So um, let's do our homework and get to an ITL. We obviously want to say hello to our v Vintage King guys. Hey, VK, what's happening? In the chat room is Drew Townsend. Drew. I'm sure his there's his screen page. We love Drew. We have a lot of Drews. Um, so um, also our homework, and you know where to contact us. That will also get up on the screen. There it is. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all the usual stuff. We got a meaty ITL to you for you, Dave. Take it away. Okay, guys. Um, this ITL requires a tiny bit of preparation and homework. Google reverberation and reverb. Study up a little bit and hope you enjoy it. Hey, guys. Welcome. Um, man. Um, Reverb's been on my mind lately since we've had several guests that I think are gifted at the use of reverb. And um, I'm going to share with you a couple of things that I've learned from uh, either directly from, from guys like Alan or by studying their records or by um, just being a nuisance and asking them all a million questions. So um, let's jump right in. I'm using a for an example, I'm using a um, a piece of um, a dream song, the artist dream. This this uh, this is a mix that's on his new mixtape on his new record. Uh, check out the whole record. This uh, I think I did three or four mixes. Uh, Pat Thrall and I worked pretty hard on uh, uh, on this project. There's several other mixers that that you should probably look at and compare everything that we've done and all. So, uh, without further ado, let's start with pre-delay. The session is 120 beats a minute, so a um, quarter would be about 500 milliseconds. Eighth would be 250. Okay, here's our pre-delay. Just want to roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Yeah, I'm shooting for the stars. Maybe we can land on the moon. And baby, I'd be a fool. You're so dope and cool. 
But you're with this other guy. So what we've done is we've taken the source, the original source that's in our imaginary cube, and the direct signal from the source to us, we've delayed that by 125 milliseconds. That, in effect, makes it feel like it's actually gotten closer because it, it's, it has to do with the relationship of reflections, early reflections to the walls and reflections to our ear. It, it's, the source actually feels like it moved closer to the wall, which gives us the impression that it's closer to us. Doesn't make sense, but think about it, it will. Time, that's the amount of time that the reverb takes to decay. That's an RT60 thing, which is basically uh, how, how long the decay took to reach minus 60 dB. Um, decay. Diffusion is, um, let me play with that for you real quick. Just want to roll with you, there's nothing else that I'd rather do. Okay, did you hear that decay? Now let's hear it again. Just want to roll with you, there's nothing else that I'd rather do. Okay, you notice that the, the high and low frequencies decayed a little differently at one end than the other. That's what diffusion does. Um, it, it, it affects the, the decay in the high frequencies. Now, early reflections, these confuse a lot of people. Just want to roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Yeah, I'm shooting for the stars. Maybe we can land on the moon. Okay, what, what you're seeing is, is, and what you're hearing is the early reflections. Those are the first reflections after the direct signal that reach you. Like lexicon, some people don't even use the term early reflection. They, 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 they don't even consider that a, a uh, an accurate term. So sometimes you might not see early reflections, but those are the first reflections that reach you. And those are important to the ear to determine spatial things within the room. Um, a neat little trick is to take a, a compressor and squish the dog piss out of the early Just reflections. Just roll with you There's nothing else that I'd rather do I'm shooting for the stars Maybe we can land on the moon And baby I'd be a fool You're so dope and cool now, They're a little loud, but you can see it, it created a, a weird kind of sense of space that in the mix sometimes I kind of like. Okay, I might be getting ahead of myself, but I enjoy this stuff. This is so much fun. Just the normal things are great, but when you do something a little out of, out of the ordinary, you've created something that's a little new and fresh sounding to the listener's ear, and sometimes that's a good thing. With me, a lot of times it's not. Okay, let's move down. Um, decorrelation, what that is, is that allows you to change the absorption characteristics of one wall as opposed to the other. So if one wall was made out of uh, cork and the other wall is made out of cement, Decorrelation is what allows you to get two different things, and that can add a sense of width to the mix. Now, a little bit of theory. The Haas effect takes a part, takes a, a role in some of this. Go back and study that. Uh, if you want to kind of keep everything seamless so the ear can't distinguish between shifting from early delays to um, early reflections to the main reflections, the main reverb, from pre-delays this, then keep Keep all of this stuff within the Haas window. High frequency information is affected a little more by air and by um, softer materials in the room. If you want to give the impression of a pop vocal being right in your face or a rap vocal, longer pre-delays and, and less high-end information in your reverb. Watch this. Just want to roll with you There's nothing else that I'd rather do yeah, I'm shooting for the stars Maybe we can land on the moon And baby I'd be a fool You're so dope okay. I've rolled off the high-end information 
and it and it got a little bit more intimate. It got a little closer to us. Let's add it back. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Now, when I exaggerate the high end, it does feel like it got a little closer than when I take some off. So it, it sounds odd that both can produce uh, the same psychoacoustic effect. Um, sometimes darker reverbs absorb in the mix a little better and, and give you the sense that the that the guy came closer but but high frequencies are actually the mathematical correct way to do it so just wanna roll with you now Dave I can't take all of those S's killing me so let's DS going into it just just wanna roll with you. Just wanna roll with you. Just wanna roll with you. Sounds a little smoother. The reverb return. I'm not. I'm DSing the lead vocal, but what I'm showing you now is DSing the input to the reverb. In other words, the sin to the reverb. You can do it in several places. So, so if you get too much high end information in your reverb, too many splattery S's by boosting this then you can DS the input. Now, another thing we can do is, is, um, is we, can, we can affect the high frequency based on altering the absorption characteristics of the, our little, our little uh, imaginary cube. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that... Okay, that's kind of sweet, watch this. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I That's darker. Now, in your mind, what, what space would have the most low end? If you said a cave, uh, you were right. Uh, that's the one that comes to my mind. You know, a gymnasium with really hard walls will create low end. Uh, uh, a lot of classical music venues go to great lengths to, to create that low end with hard surfaces, like if you look at the Hollywood Bowl. Go there sometimes if you can and just kind of imagine why the different materials are used. So let's exaggerate the low end. Just wanna rock. Just wanna rock. Just wanna rock. Okay. Now let's, 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 let's really exaggerate the low end. And think of what psychoacoustically we're we're feeling when we do this. Just wanna roll. <laughs> That's kind of neat, isn't it? Kind of digging that. I never really tried that on a vocal, but I might try that. This is this is kind of normal. Just wanna roll. You hear those high frequencies? Golly, it just gives you a whole different impression of, of where the vocalist is. Spend a little time with these things and, and, and don't listen. Um, one of the things I learned from Ron Fair, don't listen t for the reverb. Listen to what the reverb makes you feel. That's the important thing. It's, it's, you're not adding effects to something to hear them, to hear the effects and show off your engineering skills, you're adding effects to create uh, a feeling, a vibe, emphasize an emotion. And when I'm manipulating all of these parameters, I'm feeling, wow, that, 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 I got to remember that. That might be great for a, a Mary J. Bosch ballad where she's just emoting emotions, if that was a proper uh, use of the words, uh, you know, um, and then um, some of the things I feel, God, I got to remember that for uh, for like a Pink type vocal or a Christina type vocal or a Beyonce type vocal. Uh, but initially, your ear, if you're new to this, your ear might not be picking these things up because you're focusing too much on the sound. As you as you practice with some of these techniques, 
you'll, 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 your ear will be tuned more to the emotional impact that you feel from them, which is something I've learned from uh, studying a lot of the great engineers that use reverb effectively, like like Umberto, like um, Alan Myers, and people like that. L let's go over a couple of things here, Will. Um, I'm going to play, um, and I'm going I'm to I'm tweak some of the things we've been talking about, but with the drums playing, so you can kind of get a feel for um, how they affect timing, how they affect the feeling. Now, pay, pay attention, guys, because I'm going to move. I'm going to move pretty quick with this. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Yeah, I'm shooting for the stars. Maybe we can land on the moon. And baby, I'd be your fool. I feel so dope and cool. But you're with this other guy. Maybe so. That's uh, that's pretty close to what I'd put on the record. I'd add a little more reflection. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. I'll play this a couple of times. This is this is about where I'd put this, guys, uh, for this mix. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Let me show you something else. I would probably uh, record this, so I would. Just wanna roll with you. There's nothing else that I'd rather do. Yeah, I'm shooting for the stars. Maybe we can land on the moon. And baby, I'd be your fool. I feel so dope. So I would I would write it like that. There's there's no law that says you can't. You can you can write it with the return, but that sounds pretty good to me. I, I think Dream would be real happy with that. This song, he wanted to be kind of spacey and ethereal, and um, I think I think that goes a long ways towards getting that. The the parameters I'm showing you. Not every reverb has these parameters. Dverb I don't even think has half of these parameters. But you can still accomplish the same things on your own. Decorrelation, dampening uh, some of these terms, get them fixed in your head and, and what they do, uh, learn what they're trying to simulate, and then think about how that can affect you emotionally and what, what, what it's going to make you feel. And um, experiment with um, uh, using long, long pre-delays, uh, like put a, a delay in front of your reverb and, and mix 100% so that the delay is so you'd like you're using a half note delay. See what that does. Take uh, the feed to your reverb, put it out of phase, and then pan the reverb return kind of quickly. Mix that in, see what happens. Chorus the reverb return and, and, and see how that affects you emotionally. And then don't be afraid to use subtler effects in the verses and, and, and more uh, of the effects that give you a, a bigger space for the choruses. Like if you want, uh, take the guitar, put it in a very tight little room. Or, you know, I do the opposite. Take the guitar, put it in a big, big room, and then put the singer, uh, use some of the techniques that make the singer come up front, the pre-delays and the, and, the, and the EQs. And then that juxtaposition is going to make your mind really feel like the singer is up front. Uh, and and just use your imagination and then see what you feel. It might not be right for the song you're working on. Client might come in and just hate it, but that's okay. Just remember it. File it away. If you have to make notes, make notes. If you have to make a little MP3 of what it did so you can go back and see and study it later, do that. But um, just experiment. Have fun. Uh, go back and review some of the uh, science and math behind what we've talked about. And then develop your hearing so that you can... Uh, pick out the nuances of these things, develop your um, um, whatever it is that allows you to feel music, work on that, and then get a catalog uh, of techniques in your brain starting to build up that you can draw from instantly. And, and anybody can do a mix in six years, but sometimes you only have six hours, so get those things in your brain. 
and um, keep those cards and letters coming. Back to you, Dave. I can't figure out if I look more like Kenny Rogers or Julia Child now. I've got to do something about my hair. This is ridiculous. Who <laughs> <laughs> do I look more like now, Kenny Rogers or Julia Child, Drew? I would, I would say the one that's closest to a chef. Uh, <laughs> but anyhow. <laughs> holy cow. I wish I cared. Guys, Dave Isaac is with us today. Uh, it, uh, one of the reasons that, that I asked Dave to be on is I just love his mixes. And, and there's something that Dave is doing that, that I think we can all learn from today. He's, he's, he's a from the heart guy. He's skilled out the wazoo. Dave, thanks for coming by, man. It's Thank been a minute. Me. It's been a minute. You're welcome. Thank you. We've been, uh, we've been uh, out in L.A. for a while. Our paths have crossed forever. Good to yeah. see you again. Same here. Three Grammys, um, Eric Clapton, Prince, um, Madonna, uh, tons of people he's worked with, Stevie Wonder, Marcus Miller, um, Puffy, Aretha, and then, and then a lot of records that are my favorite records that, that don't quite get into the lexicon, but Clark Sisters, you know, mm -hmm. and stuff like that, That's that so. just change your life kind of records on more ways than one. Dave, man, first of all, thanks for coming out and hanging. We talked a little <laughs> earlier. It's just, it just feels, like, uh, feels like we're related. Uh, we, we have so many things about our profession that we do together, you know. Your, your mix philosophy has to be a big part of of why your mixes sound so good. Is it something you can articulate like in a sentence or two or is it just a lifestyle or? Uh, I start from the, the essence of the energy, you know, of the music. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> coming from Motown, when, you know, Motown to me was taken over. Mm -hmm. um, he says a, Motown, he means Motown. <laughs> he was born, from, born in Detroit. He's got the same, same water in his veins as Aretha and those guys. Yeah, and, and people, you know, they, they tend to think that Motown was the label, but it was actually the neighborhood, you know. Oh, um, yeah. <clears throat> the, mothers and the, the mothers and the sisters wanted to uh, do the hair for the artists. Um, the, the fathers and the brothers wanted to uh, either drive people around or uh, cut the hair, you know, so everybody it was, was Motown. Village. Yeah, it was, you know, and Detroit is small, so the, the projects area was even smaller. So, you know, as a kid, for me to see all this talent driving around and they would, you know, do the things like give out candy or get the water sprinklers turned on. But, you know, we would see them drive by in the Cadillacs and, and, you know, when people wanted to sell the albums, it was from the neighborhood, you know, and at night you go upstairs and you see them on TV on the Ed Sullivan. So it was a way to see how to take it from the street to, mm. you know, opening before the Beatles or with the Rolling Stone. How, how important, like for me, <clears throat> South Florida is a big part of what I do musically and what, what I do in a mix. Mm. So that environment was pretty important in, in terms of the way you sound and the way you, you, you approach music, right? Yeah. It's hard to delineate yeah. how, but it just does, doesn't it? It's, it's just, it was just a part of me, you know, and music was always around, you always heard it, um, even though, you know, it was the Motor City, uh, if you drove a car, you were listening to Motown music, or, or some artists from around the neighborhood, and, and we had more, we had the gospel, um, you know, uh, at a certain point we had George Clinton and Roger and those guys, Ohio players were in town a lot, so it was just always music, but not just from the cars, um, guys really were standing under the street lights hoping that Smokey would drive by and discover them. Bands were practicing outside or in the garages, so the music you heard were real people performing, you know, so it was, it was a different time. Do you think that, um, that, 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 that like, like the, the concept of schools versus being self-taught, uh, you were self-taught. Did, did you feel you missed something by not going to a school, or did it, did it impede your progress? Or well, uh, I always have felt that at points. But uh, at one point, uh, Marcus Miller was telling me that uh, it was better that I hadn't because I didn't have any boundaries. Mm -hmm. You know, I went with what felt right or what sounded right. Mm -hmm. um, and, and he would choose that over that. And, you know, at the end of the day, when I start to think about it, I feel the same way. Yeah. You and I both have our engineering heroes, and then we've got our musician heroes. And at the top of that list is Marcus Miller. Guy Lee is, is uh, 
you in here are very close. Is he as gifted as my friend Keith Andes and some of my other buddies tell me that he is? Yeah, yeah. You, you, you really don't see as much of what he really can do just because he wants to keep it more geared toward the producer and bass. Mm -hmm. But he can play uh, piano, guitar, uh, clarinet, sax just as well as anything. How does How does having those exposures Am I constructing my sentence grammatically correctly there? How does that contribute to your engineering? I know for me, uh, we were talking about the cameo guys mm -hmm. being around Kevin Kendrick and Charlie Singleton, Nathan, mm -hmm. Ethan, Charlie, and those guys, um, and Larry, really affected my engineering uh, in ways that I still sometimes realize, whoa, I, I'm, I'm still doing that the same way. Did you have that experience that, that the, the, hanging around great musicians can make you a better mixer? And engineer. <clears throat> well, I mean, for me, I, I started as a musician, so yeah, same here. that that helped. And then, you know, getting around guys at Marcus's level or uh, Wayne Shorter and those guys, mm -hmm. it definitely made you more aware of what the musicians were looking at, what they were thinking about, what they were feeling, and making sure that it doesn't get lost. Plus, you know? when you engineer for them, they didn't cut you any slack. Yeah, yeah they expected exactly. you to be as good an engineer as they were a musician. And we were just learning. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's also, particularly with some of the people you worked with, I mean, you're currently doing a mix with Prince and mm -hmm. so on and so forth. You're, you're dealing in high IQ areas. Yes. You, you can't come bring a weak game right. to that. And I think sometimes it's important for our audience to understand you got to bring it. Like, yeah. this isn't something you get to fumble around or think because you have, you know, some plugins and you know your way around it. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean that you don't try, but mm -hmm. it just means that at, at a certain level, you got to hold your own, or yeah. folks will let you know. Yeah. So oh, let me yeah, ask you this, did. right? Mm -hmm. yeah. so, so as a musician, because you you play various things, mm -hmm. did that help inform not only your engineering but also gain you respect with guys who had high musical IQ? Yes, um, because I could hear when they were trying to speak, mm -hmm. you know, as they played. So uh, when it came to producing, I would make sure those areas didn't get lost, mm -hmm. you know, which let them know that I was attentive to what they were doing mm -hmm. versus taking it out or uh, leveling it out. Yeah. Sometimes the emotion of what they play is them actually trying to make a statement. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, Great. that definitely helps. Dave, uh, one of the things I like about your mix is, is the effects don't sound like an afterthought. If it was a bowl of spaghetti, you didn't just throw in some garlic near the end. You plan, or, or somehow organically, your effects just seem to be, just do everything that they should do. How, how do you accomplish that? First of all, do you even think about it, or is it just, is just who you are? It's, it's funny. Um, as a kid, we, we talked about it. Uh, I used to listen to music on the floor. Uh, I would take my dad's speakers and it was quadraphonic then oh. but uh lay on my back and close my eyes and try to imagine what was happening down the street at motown and the one thing that intrigued me the most was stevie you know how would he see this the sun and this girl in this blue dress he talks about and uh i didn't realize that at that time it was training my ears to a degree to to hear things that i liked that i didn't like um but more importantly to hear distractions in the music what's that um Anything that distracts me from the melody or the vocal or oh, things like yeah. that. Um, so then I started to think about Stevie. Um, he obviously, when he sings, or, or someone like him, or um, let's say uh, uh, Jose Feliciano, they're not distracted by the girl in the front row. They're just into the moment, they're into the song. So spiritually, they, it comes across differently. So um, I've taken that into what I've what I do because I listen to it and I'm, first I make sure there's no distractions in the music. Nothing that distracts me um, uh, from the melody or from the rhythm or from the feeling of the song. That's a pretty important yeah. sentence right yeah. there, guys. Uh, rewind that part of the tape and check that again. <laughs> Quote board. And then um, also in regards to Stevie, um, when I first got to LA, I had the opportunity to work with him. Um, we had met quite a few times in Detroit, but he, um, at one point he called me out here middle of the night, and um, I went to his studio and then he walked around as though he, you know, he could see. So I started to think about it, and in the session, um, when they wanted me to pull up the mix, I asked uh, Nathan, uh, "Could I turn the lights off because I wanted to hear it like Stevie and not and not have any distractions because he was going to go into a vocal." 
and I wanted to make sure that nothing was in his way. Um, and at that point, it only took me maybe 15 minutes, if that, to pull up a mix that he could go and sing straight down. But I was real curious as to how he could walk around and do the things he was doing without any assistance. So I started to think about reflections and things like that, and I started to see uh, different episodes of people who, um, like there's this one guy that can, he, he speaks in clicks for I certain saw things. That on National Geographic, yeah, yeah. brain games. Yeah, and he can get around parking lots and things yeah. like that. So now in my mixes, I use delay and I use things to uh, make things sound natural or feel natural to me, like I'm actually seeing this room. Mm -hmm. um, and and I also mix it in a way to where, like if we're talking right now my inflections of my voice changes, and Stevie hears that. He's, uh, he, he understands that energy, so he knows who he's speaking to also. But it also lets you know how sincere I am, the, the, the way I say things, the inflection. So I mix that into the music. As I listen to hear where they have it, and then I see how much further I could take it to where when you solo the artist or when you solo a musician, you feel what they're thinking. The, the concept of starving one sense to increase and heighten the the information you get from another sense. I mean, that's that's something ap applicable in the mixed world for you. I, for me, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Barney uh, Perkins, oh. he was the first person that made me hear the speakers disappear to a degree, to where I just heard a performance. Wow. And uh, Ray Bardani is another one that did that for oh, me. Oh, wow, Ray. And uh, it, it made me really go and try to figure out how do I express myself through the mixes that same way, to, to, to make the listener just forget about the speakers and hear the music, hear the emotion in the music, but also as a mix engineer, because um, I'm torn between pro musician, producer, and mix engineer, but as a mix engineer, guide their ear, which is one thing we used to do in Detroit a lot, guide their ear to each element of the music so at the end of the song, they could actually, if you ask them, they could actually name everything in the song or the instruments they think they heard. So that's, a, that's creating a, a visual approach to hearing in a sense, yes. right? Mm -hmm. Kind of like we're about mm -hmm. to talk about the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the uh, <laughs> in a little bit. <laughs> yeah. uh, so to, to, to nail you down on something specific, like, like something like, like a, a reverb, like mm -hmm. we just did a little segment on reverb, mm -hmm. what would be your your decision-making process when to put reverb on a vocal. Take me through that and why. Well, sometimes I, I, I wouldn't use a reverb. Sometimes I might use a delay. Mm -hmm. um, just because if I close my eyes and I'm listening in a certain type of room, I'm going to hear the reflections off the wall. So I might use early reflections, mm -hmm. um, depending on where I'm going to place something in the mix mm -hmm. um, or the house effect. Mm -hmm. to, to make it sound just more natural. Mm -hmm. And then I fool the listener's ear mm -hmm. by putting reverb on something else, and the listener gets a sense that it's on everything. Mm -hmm. you know? But most of the time, I might start with delays first, just to, yeah, to, yeah. to uh, give a sense of uh, actually creating walls. Within Do you the ever think of, of reverbs as, as a series of incredibly short delays and then, and then build, build up like that? Uh, sometimes, I, sometimes I, I just don't like. I don't even like when when I say the word reverb. I sound so rednecky and and, and ignorant. I, I just sometimes try to just call them delays, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so when you when when you're at the point of the mix process where you're 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 putting levels in, you've got things sounding pretty good. How do you know? how loud the vocal should be relative to the kick, relative to the snare, relative to the guitars. Mm -hmm. I, I, I know you just feel it, but it, every once in a while we have to think about it. Mm -hmm. Those once in a while processes, uh, describe for our audience what goes through your mind. Well, that has changed for me. I mean, when I was going through um, trying to learn, looking at books or talking to people, it was always a thing of starting with the kick drum. But I learned uh, production-wise to to actually start, for me, with whatever the main element is, mm -hmm. whether it's the vocal or whatever. And, and I'll only spend a quick amount of time, a uh, short amount of time, rather, on the vocal. I'll bring it up, make sure it sounds good, see what kind of energy is there. Then I'll bring up the kick and figure out with this song uh, if it's going to be uh, a drum-driven song or uh, a beat 
you know, because like Prince, Michael, the kick drums were almost as loud as the vocal. Mm -hmm. So it depends on, you know, if it's R&B, I'm going to make it a little bit louder. But then I'll take the vocal out, then I'll start with the kick drum. Mm -hmm. So now I don't, I don't start with the drums and then get everything in. Then when I put the vocal in, I realize I have to pull everything back. Mm -hmm. I, I put the vocal in, pull up the kick drum, see where I like it, take the vocal out. Now I could go. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, near the end of the mix, when you're trying to get everything balanced just right, mm -hmm. do you do that by feel or do you... Like I know a lot of a lot of mixers. Well, I can't say a lot, but I, I know a couple of mixers that say they mix to the level of the snare, or they mm -hmm. mix to the level of this or that. Do, do you do you pick out an element in the mix that, that's your benchmark zero, and then put things above and below it, or is just is it just all the spices at one time? Uh, a, a situation with David Sanborn taught me to put the main person first. Um, the guy paying the bill? Yeah, put them first. <laughs> because we, we had done a, we, we were doing an album, Big Engineer was mixing. He had spent maybe two days. And he pulled up the mix, had it going, sounding good, and then Dave came in and said, I hate it, it doesn't sound like the demo. So, you know, I said, well, Dave, Gosh, you know, never we, we, <laughs> <laughs> you know we're, we're trying to make it sound better than the demo, but let me come down to the studio and see what it sounds like. So when I, when I came down, uh, uh, I you heard done the demo. Yeah, because okay. we had, you know, it, it was just, I was, we we recorded it to sound like the record. That's the one thing about the way that I came up uh, recording. Mm -hmm. it, when you pull up the faders, it should sound like the record. Mm -hmm. But um, this engineer, he had these other ideas. He was listening to other music, so he wanted to incorporate this stuff. And so I said, well, really, it's just your levels and some of the panning, where the energy is. So I, I asked him if he had the console cleared. He said, yes. So I pulled all the faders down. Mm -hmm. And the first thing I did was pull up Dave. So from that point, Dave was straight. Mm -hmm. Pulled everything else up, and within 15 minutes, he said, I love it. And of course, the engineer was like, oh, that's cool. But I said, really, it's, your effects, your EQs, everything's still there. It's just the blend, mm -hmm. the energy, where the energy was. So, um, and that's another thing, too, with, with mixing for me is uh, in listening in the dark or with my eyes closed, it has taught me to hear energy uh, um, distractions also. Mm -hmm. Meaning... You're the first person I've heard talk about distractions, but dude, I'm stealing that. I'm telling you, <laughs> that is mine. I love that. That's, I'll, I'll that's, work out the publishing. Okay. I'll work out the publishing between the two that, hours. That makes, the, that makes two hours on the 405 worth it today. Yeah. Just that concept. <laughs> well, it, 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 if you listen closely at a certain point you realize where to pan um, and I teach that to students sometimes because if the musician actually wasn't listening to an instrument when they were performing it they're gonna clash in that area so I might pan them someplace else where it fits like a puzzle mm -hmm. and when it does it's 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 amazing how musical it sounds it, it just fits just right but um, also it starts to balance itself so um, to get to that point that you were talking about in the mixes, I balance the energy, and then I balance the frequencies. So as I pull up a fader, I quickly hear where it's sitting before I add any EQ or, or, mm -hmm. or hardware or software. Mm -hmm. I hear where it's at, and then when I pan it to that place, I visualize that speaker as having drawers or compartments. And when I pan it there, now I'm deciding what am I going to pan in that side that also fits to where, if it's something else in the same area, I'm going to pan it to the other side. Mm -hmm. So that way, eventually, I have this You spend a lot of time frequency. thinking about placement. But it, it's, it's not, that, not that long. I mean, I can get a mix to where I'm not distracted in an hour. No, I, I, in the opening, I alluded to this hybrid concept, which, mm -hmm. you know, in your career, you've got mixing and producing, and you're an artist, and you've done movies, and you've done live stuff, and... Mm -hmm with again with really demanding uh, clients I, I would think when you were coming up that was innovative today it's almost necessary, necessary. Yeah. It's, yeah. is that yeah. right yeah expound yeah. on that yeah. a little bit well you know for me in Detroit uh, the gift was being able to keep a session moving at one o'clock in the morning mm -hmm. if, if uh, MIDI was new at that time so you know if a keyboard uh, stopped working how do we get around it um, if Simpty stopped working how do we get around it so as I started to see these things take place, my thinking was, if I can figure that out, I got a job. Mm -hmm. If I can figure that out, I get more money, you know. And not knowing that it was all preparing me for production at the end of the day. Mm. 
So would you advise our audience that that approach about mastering various ways is a, is a good thing that they should think oh, about? Oh, yeah, because it, it, it helps me. Um, it helps me when I work with other engineers, when I'm just taking a producer's uh, hat. Mm -hmm. It helps me when I'm working with musicians. It helps me when we're coming up with sounds with the, in the keyboards because at a certain point, if I have to, I can sit there and make this out myself and, mm -hmm. and let everybody get back to what they were doing. Mm -hmm. But um, it, it, it has taught me how to really take uh, the time in the studio for the creative side mm -hmm. versus um, wasting money not knowing what to do or you get to uh, trying to figure stuff out. Yeah. You can get to it. Yeah. 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 Time is money. Dave, you, um, you've worked in so many different genres. Mm -hmm. genres? Whatever you think in 2012. It's whatever you think. I can't say that word. It's sure. got to be the haircut. Um, hair roots are going too deep into my brain. Um, give me a 15 second overview of, of, the, of the difficulties in the, in the 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 things that you think most when you when you think about doing a jazz record as opposed to a rock record as opposed to an R&B or a hip hop or a film score because you've had incredible successes in, in all of those and I if I'm mixing uh, a real edgy rock record and my next mix is a is a a, a ballad I might ruin that ballad I mm. I don't it takes me about a day to shift you okay. know I mean I'll fix it before it goes out the door but how, Give me an overview, because like, like, there's elements about mixing rock records I love because I don't have to work as hard in certain areas. The mm -hmm. live drums I have to work hard on, mm -hmm. but sounds I don't have to work as hard as the R&B world, you know. Right. And then jazz, you've got serious jazz credits and credibility. Well, with the jazz, um, that's more about tracking, isn't it? Yeah, it's more on the recording side, um, and and I also noticed that with. Uh, with uh, Alan, because you know I have had the opportunities to be involved with projects where Alan Myerson was the okay. engineer. He's, he's my favorite. And and I I do realize that with jazz, you know, you're basically just capturing the instruments, you're capturing um, the the musicians. So you don't have to work as hard as uh, let's say with uh, uh, a Whitney Houston or Anita, where we had to really take time to figure out the sound uh, sound selection, create the sounds if we had to. Um, and that kind of thing. Um, with any of the rock stuff, yeah, you're right. Again, it's just capturing the musicians, but then it's miking the amps or the garage or the, you know, the place where we're going to make it have this huge sound. Yeah. So I got a sports question for you. Okay. How's your bat? You ready to hit some out, out of the park? Sure. Yeah. You ready to tee him up there? Yeah, I promised we were going to do this one question, but we can do it during CEO. Okay. Okay. Batter's box. Dave's going to talk to us today about uh, um, effects. So the first effect that pops into his mind when he hears the word lead vocal is? Uh, I'd say Bricastio, the EMT 250 software. Wow, yeah. the UAD one? Yeah, UAD. Uh, background vocals? Uh, Dimension D. Oh, I love Dimension <coughs> D. Acoustic guitar? Uh, the house effect. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm glad you said that because I want them to do their homework about the house effect. <laughs> uh, rap leads? Uh, filter. EQ, you filter the top in out, and have that as a, uh, uh, like parallel. Uh, acoustic mm -hmm. piano or synth piano, whatever, virtual piano. Uh, room, I'd say early reflections. Oh, good. Mm -hmm. early reflections. Uh, synth strings. Uh, dimension D, but uh, very, uh, I would pull it, uh, I would boost the top in and pull it back in the mix to give it like a, Something that I feel I hear in Bruce O'Dean mixes. Oh, okay. Mm. The, the UAD Dimension D is pretty yeah, yeah, cool. Yeah, yeah. Uh, synth bass. Uh, flange and 300 hertz. Flange, wow. Mm -hmm. Write that down, Drew. <laughs> um, electric guitars. Uh, foot pedals. Oh, good. <laughs> that would be me, too. Uh, program kick. Uh, uh, R bass. Oh, yeah, it's a beast. Mm -hmm. well, everything waves makes is incredible and usable. Mm -hmm. uh, program snare. Mm, delay. Delay? Mm -hmm. On the snare? Yeah. yeah. How, how much? Uh, real short, I would keep it within like 35 milliseconds, but then I would spread it out 
So then that way the snare sounds. So you'd hasserize that exactly, too. Exactly, exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, man, killed it. That went too fast. We <laughs> got room for the. I, I gave my word at some point we'd discuss the rule of thirds. No, no, we're going to bring it I want to also, I want to add to the bus yeah. though. The okay. Bus. The bus would be. Uh, you put effects on the bus? I would put uh, either right now uh, Stephen Slate or uh, Isotope. Oh, okay, you're right. Both isotope, of those are great. Yeah, isotope, I would use the uh, enhancer as far as the harmonics or the uh, stereo. Yes. Stephen, Stephen and I are planning um, a little surprise for April Fools. I don't know if I should say that. <laughs> oh, God. I love Stephen. <laughs> Let me, uh, let's really quickly introduce our guy, Drew Adams, over in the corner office. Drew, you there? Yes, I am. You got a few things for us? I do, I do. Hit it. Um, uh, question hey, from Drew, both. at hey. some point, ask about the rule of thirds. Deal. We'll start off with Andrew Williams Spence uh, for both Daves. How do you combat reverbs muddying up the mix? Is it good to use a delay as opposed to reverb? Uh, for me, it's where I place it. Um, if, if I'm going to have an instrument that's further back, um, the balance between the reverb and the actual signal and the EQ would make a difference, but uh, typically I use delays on things that are closer just because in real life to me that's how I would hear things and I use the reverb as a back wall in the mix. Mm -hmm. For me, uh, Andrew, great question. Um, I, 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 had a limited, um, I had a limited amount of time in the ITL and I didn't go over it, but, but you know, EQ is your friend, just roll the crap out. Mm -hmm. And um, um, don't be afraid to manipulate the sin, to manipulate the return of the reverb. There's nothing sacred, man. Just EQ it, chorus it, pan it, dimension D it, just anything. And, and the, more, the, more, the, more you, the more you do that's unique, the, the more your mixes are going to stand out and sound new. Very cool. Uh, another one from Soundright Pro uh, for Dave Isaac. You speak about energy in the voice. Can you relate that back to frequencies if more than or if more than one, please describe what you would call each, i.e. 10K equals air. Yeah. Ooh. Uh, well, it depends. Um, energy, if I had to say in a lead vocal, let's say the, the majority of it is uh, in the mid-range, upper mid-range. So f in that area, I might have it hit the compressor a certain way so it changes the color. So it sounds as though, let's say if it's a... Uh, 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 a singer like uh, Marvin Winans or Keisha Cole or someone like that, when they say a certain word, I will add energy or add a frequency in that area so it sounds like they're really saying this to me. So I feel like they're, if I take all the music out, they're standing across talking to me. So I may boost the level, I may change the EQ, so the color changes so she becomes or he becomes real. Um, if that answered the question. It does, it does. Yeah, uh, sound right. Um, this isn't a direct answer to your question, but uh, Dave's answer is so perfect. But it's amazing, Dave, when you do the slightest thing to a great singer's vocal, they hear it. Uh, and they are so in tune with what they do and how to convey that energy and emotion. And when you amplify it, you get slaps on the back. When you do something they don't like, they hear, like Mary J can hear the most minute changes in, in her performance. Ask your rule of thirds question. Well, Dave uh, brought this up. Uh, early in my career, a lot of the magazine articles, I was obsessed with, with a correlation between how we hear and how we see. And so I started adapting rules I had learned from my painting and photography background to mixing. And one of those rules was the rule of thirds, uh, where you take, a, where you take a, a painting or a canvas and, and, and you dissect it into thirds this way and then you dissect it again into thirds and then I don't know if you can see it but these four nodes here become your focal points I don't know, I don't know if you can see that Will but just use your imagination so in mixing you try to make sure that these focal points and these nodes receive the most attention and I, I think Dave probably does it better than me what, what are your thoughts on it Dave? Well, I mean, you blew me away when I heard you say that at the seminar that I met you at. Uh -huh. um, for me, um, it's, it's something similar to what I've heard you say, that the sacred areas are the left, center, and right. 
um, and any areas in between are really to define the mix more. Mm -hmm. um, the listener really only, they, w they will get it as that's coming from the left, that's coming from the right. But in the software or on the console, when we make minute changes to the panning, um, it's really only for us to separate, to keep things from masking. Mm -hmm. um, and once we do that, it, it, uh, it allows the listener to see the picture better. Yeah, yeah because you think visually, uh, probably even a little more than I do. I, I agree with you 100%. In fact, you, I, I'm glad you articulated that first because it's better than me. <laughs> Guys, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this today, but I want to do a, a whole show, maybe even a chapter in a book on that. But Dave will get you started thinking about it, and then um, this would be a good discussion for us to have on the uh, Facebook page, too. I'm not dodging you. You know I love you guys, and I would never do that. I'm just not really 100% prepared yet to go into the depth, and I don't want to tell you anything that's not accurate right now. But thanks, Dave. Okay. Drew, two, tee us up one more. Delio. Um, this, one, this one's good for both Daves. Uh, from Cam C. Millen. Uh, hmm? If you had to name one thing, a moment, a hit, a tune, whatever, just the thing you are most proud of or you think really sums up you in your career so far, what would it be? Re 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 read that again. Okay, it's a little wordy. If you had to name one thing, a moment, a hit, a tune, whatever, just the thing you are most proud of or you think really sums up you in your career so far, what would it be? Uh, for me, my dad... Grew up as kids with uh, James Brown, and they were good friends, and his, his, my dad's grandma would take care of James at times. And as they got older, um, my dad ended up going his way to the Army, and James became James. Um, and around 13 or 14, my dad took us to meet James. My dad passed away before I was able to produce James, but one, um, in uh, 1999, I produced James. Wow. So it, it was a full circle moment for me, but that's probably one of my most proudest moments. Wow. For me, it was, um, I, I've got the most curious combination of massive ego and total insecurity, and they seem to manifest simultaneously in my brain sometimes. I mean, you've seen me do it where I'm like, God, I'll never work again, and then some days I'm the best engineer to have ever lived. But uh, I learned guitar at such a young age from my mom. Uh, I guess I was 10, 11, 12, and I got applause. And um, I liked it, Herb. <laughs> that kind of changed. Uh, I, I, I was on a good career path to be a, a basketball player. I had a pretty good uh, painting background from my parents and photography. And that was the moment that kind of... Changed it. Yeah, I remember it vividly mm -hmm. and, and liking the feeling. I was too ugly to get chicks any other way, and that kind of solidified it too. So, mm, no strapping on a guitar is. I, I'm feeding you straight lines in case you don't know it. <laughs> I know you are. I'm just a boy. The guitar is probably the greatest chick magnet ever invented. I mean, look at this face. I got laid. <laughs> Well, <laughs> what a way to wrap it up. <laughs> so two things before we wrap it up. First of all, we that have... That ought to play good in Russia, right, Roman? <laughs> Listen, absolutely. Uh, we just increased guitar sales about a thousand percent. Absolutely. Not just, to mention hair color and cookbooks. Put and your mug on stuff. So, so two things. Kenny One, uh, we, we, we're going to have to confer the doctor title on you instead of just Dave Isaacs because <laughs> oh, you came in here with a ton of knowledge. Uh, so. Thank you. Thank, you. Thank you so he much, man. Teacher, her, no, man. no question. No question. If you have a chance to learn anything from, from Dave or get to his website or whatever the case may be, I'm sure it will do you well. Uh, again, this is a redundant question, but I always say, will you come back? Oh, of course. And the reason I always say that is because our guests have so much to impart. In fact, I think Ann hit you about wanting to do oh, something MSLE, else. So, yeah, so we, lots of stuff coming for you, and that's why we we're always want to make sure, because I'm sure one guest at one point in time is going to say, hell no, I don't want to come back at all this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, well, with, pleasure to have you. That's what you say, not the guest. That's, that's right. right. Coming back. Pleasure to have you, uh, Roman. Pleasure to have you in from Russia. Thank you to all our friends around the world who, mm -hmm. who tune in, and, and Dave, take us home. You know, while we're thinking, Herb, we got a great staff. I mean, it starts with Will and, and, and no it question. goes down to the guys wearing polo shirts just to make you happy. We just got a wonderful staff. And guys, thanks so much. Um, I'll leave you with this thought. Um, Dave and I were talking earlier about a lot of the plugins we use, we used 
and learn from the analog. So when, when Dave and I go to a plug-in, we approach it completely different than, 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 than some of you guys that are 13, 14, 15 that have never seen the analog version. You guys think that we have an advantage, but you guys have the advantage because you're not prejudiced by the limitations of the analog piece of gear. Like, like, like Drew every once in a while will, will use a piece of gear that he never used the original on and it's so different than what I thought. And, and I'm, I steal those ideas. They're great because he's not limited. He, 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 so uh, the inadequacies that you're feeling don't. You've got a big advantage over the rest of the world because you can approach it with a, with a clear mind and use it creatively as opposed to being limited by some of the things from the past that, that analog imposes on us. All right, guys. Uh, I, I'm not at liberty to say, but I think we got a good show coming up next week. If not, it's going to be a great show. Thanks a lot. See you next week.